I'm hopeful that you've had a chance to watch that previous lecture, The War Years, and especially what comes out of World War II, which is the Cold War. This ideological struggle between the United States and uh, the Soviet Union. In many ways, guys, what you're going to see emerge in the post-World War II years would be two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, and each is trying to export its own sphere of influence throughout the world. First Europe, and as you'll see in this class, beyond that as well. Where we left off the last time was 1949, and I told you that 49 was not a very good year for American policymakers, primarily because that was the year that the Chinese went over to communism. We had promised the rest of the world that we would not see this. We would not see any expansion of communism. That was our whole goal, was to contain it where it presently existed. And here, one of the most populated countries in the world goes over to communism. Bad news. The worst news was that the Soviet Union detonated its own atomic bomb, and our monopoly on that weapon ended in 1949. And so, when you've got these great big huge heavy stories, in order to process them, there's something about the human brain that likes to hear a good comforting story. And the story that we told ourselves as Americans was that there was no way that the Soviets could do this on their own, there was no way that the Chinese could pull this off all on their own. There had to be an inside job. There had to be American-born communists that were selling secrets uh, to the enemy, that were selling the United States out, so to speak, and that was the reason why we were seeing what we were seeing in 1949. Now, within this political backdrop, everything that even remotely got close to radicalism, socialism, communism, anything like that, became deeply, deeply suspicious, right? Are you one of these enemies from within that we're talking about here? And certainly there's elements of the New Deal that would qualify as socialistic. And so this is a very delicate balancing act, um, maintaining and even expanding this uh, New Deal security, making life more secure for more Americans. It's very difficult to balance that with this new mantra of anti-communism. And as you're about to see, poor Harry Truman is going to be caught right in the middle of this. Now, the last time we met, I introduced you to Harry Truman. He was placed on Franklin Roosevelt's uh, presidential ticket as his vice president in 1944, because in that year, anybody that was within the White House could see that Roosevelt's days were numbered. He was very sick. And so Truman is added on because we see him as a viable number two. On the one hand, he is this senator from Missouri that was seen as a protege of Franklin Roosevelt, a um, deep believer in the ideals of the New Deal. But the other reason that they liked him is he was a cold warrior, right? He was drawing a hard line when it comes to how to deal with the communists. And everybody that was in the White House in 1944 knew that that was going to be an issue, that Joseph Stalin was a force to be reckoned with, and we needed somebody very solid in there. And that's one of the reasons that we got Truman. Now, Truman is going to be one of the most unlucky presidents, unluckiest presidents in American history. Certainly not the most unlucky, but he's up there. He's going to inherit this world from Franklin Roosevelt, not just the war and major decisions like whether or not to drop the atomic bomb. In the aftermath of the war, he's got a lot on his plate, including an economic downturn, right? It's not necessarily his fault. Um, the war ended. We didn't need the tanks, planes, and ships that we once upon a time did. And that translated into a downturn in the economy. But something else that came out of the war, we mentioned this when we talked about the effects on the home front, was more than a million dues-paying, card-carrying members of unions, right? And these unionists and the people that represented them, they were bound and determined to 
partake in this post-war affluent society. They, they wanted the better paychecks to continue. They wanted to do things like become consumers. And so when corporate America began to scale back and began to uh, move in a direction that the unions didn't like so much, what they did was they walked away from their jobs. They struck, uh, they demonstrated, they boycotted. Um, generally speaking, in 1945-1946, you're going to see a very tumultuous time period when it comes to labor management relations. But for the outside looking in, this looks a lot like workers fighting their bosses. It looks a little too much, for comfort that is, uh, to what a lot of people refer to as class conflict, what happened in Moscow, 1917. Keep in mind, we're, we're in the backdrop of what will later become known as the Second Red Scare, deep-seated fear of communism. What's going to happen in 1946 is the Republicans are going to win many, many seats in Congress. And that's going to be instrumental when it comes to passing a new law aimed at uh, curtailing, controlling the power of organized labor unions. It's going to be known as the Taft-Hartley Act. And ostensibly, it, its goal is to make sure that unions did not get too powerful for their own good and did not interrupt or disrupt the American economy. But it's got a much more covert goal to it, or at least it does in my own humble opinion. Um, one of the things that Taft-Hartley did was it transitioned the authority from the federal level to the state level when it comes to are unions legal or how, how easy will it be to form a union. Ultimately, this is going to give rise to what you and I call the right to work state, which is a play on words. That's not really what you mean, right? What you really mean is how easy or not easy is it going to be to form a union in your own state. It's not the federal government that gets to decide like it did with the Wagner Act in 1935. No, this time around it will be the state of Tennessee, Louisiana, Texas that will decide how easy it is or is not to form a union. There was something else that was quite handy to the business community when it came to Taft-Hartley. Given the fact that communism is a dirty word in 1946, there's a lot of people that say we, we really got to watch out for these guys. Taft Hartley also forbade known members of the Communist Party from serving in unions as, as, as officials, as leaders. You had to sign this contract that said, I'm not now, nor have I ever been a member of the Communist Party. We were worried, at least on paper, that communists were controlling these unions and, and using the unions for their, their own bidding. Right? Ultimately, Taft-Hartley and its non-communist element served a very useful purpose to the business community in the sense that it, it, it came across, at least from the outside looking in, like it was really being tough on communism. Just safeguarding in a good old-fashioned American institution like unions from infiltration by communists that were up to no good. Unofficially, its target was not communists. Nobody that was anybody that really believed that the Communist Party really represented a threat in this capacity anyway in 1946. It was a tiny little sliver of an organization, and even in its heyday, it wasn't that big. And you're going to see it collapse in not too long, a few years down the road. The, the true aim, the true target when it comes to Taft-Hartley was not communists, it was liberals, right? By making it more and more difficult to form unions and transferring that power from the federal level to the state level, ultimately what it will do is it's really going to reshuffle um, the industrial landscape. If you're the CEO of General Motors and you need to build a new state-of-the-art plant, um, you get to build it anywhere you want to. Are you going to open it in Flint, Michigan, which has got a really heavy union presence, and Michigan itself has got a really friendly government when it comes to unions and unionism? Or would you maybe move it to Arkansas, Tennessee, where unions are not as strong, and your state government is not nearly as hospitable to unions, right? And so on the surface level, when it said the, the part of the part of Taft Hartley is about making sure that communists can't do anything bad with the unions, its real goal is to really curb 
union power all across the board. And you'll see this when factory after factory begin to relocate from the north and the northeast to the south and the southwest. More of that a little bit later once we get to the 1970s. But for right now, if, you, if you're not able to tell, this country is becoming more and more conservative. And in 1948, every poll in America had Harry Truman going down in defeat to the Republican challenger, a guy by the name of Thomas E. Dewey. And if you're looking at the PowerPoint there, that, that screen, the Chicago Daily Tribune actually went to print that night proclaiming Dewey to be, in fact, the winner of the election. Somewhere in the wee hours of that election night, Truman managed to pull off this political miracle. But I want to say this before we go any further. He's elected president in 1948, but he's, he, he's not inheriting Roosevelt's world. Keep in mind, both in 32 and in 36, Roosevelt not only wins, but huge majorities of Democrats are winning with him. They're winning in the Congress. They're winning in the Senate. They're winning all across the board. That's not going to be the case with Harry Truman, okay? So the domestic agenda that Harry Truman is really going to get behind is going to come to be known as the Fair Deal. And for your notes, what the Fair Deal was designed to do was to pick up where Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal left off. Generally speaking, it was designed to improve the standard of living of the American people. But there's really only three elements of it that I want you to know. Three parts that are really important. One, the Fair Deal was trying to improve education. It wanted to make it easier to go to school. It wanted more people going to school and graduating from school. More money being pumped into the K-12 through system. Second, it wanted to improve health care. I mean, that was one of the big shortcomings of the New Deal. It never really had much of an answer for the health care crisis in this country. And Harry Truman wanted to address that as well. Lastly, and this is most critically of all, civil rights. Harry Truman was not necessarily what you'd call an outspoken advocate of civil rights, but as president, he once said that it literally turned his stomach when he saw some of these African-American veterans returning to their states of origin and being attacked by white mobs when they would get off the bus that we were going to get serious about civil rights in this country and it didn't he didn't care you know who he needed to go through to do that well here's the thing about the democratic party really until the mid 1960s all roads lead through the south that should not come that much of a surprise if you've been following along closely in this class. You know that the South was a one-party system. It was democratic country. And you should remember that even for all of his political wizardry, Franklin Roosevelt was never able to get an anti-lynching law on the federal books. And one of the prim primary reasons was the South didn't want it. And if the South didn't want it, it didn't happen. It was not a political rea reality. Um, there's a lot of reasons that the South is going to say it doesn't want something like an anti-lynching bill, but the bottom line was it didn't want it and it never happened. And so when Harry Truman says, we're going to get serious about civil rights, that's a non-starter for many, many, many Southern states. As a matter of fact, when he proclaimed that we were going to get serious about civil rights on the campaign trail, he's not even president yet, there were numerous household names in American politics. Strom Thurmond from South Carolina, he's one. George Wallace from Alabama, he's another. There are numerous senators and congressmen as a revolt, or at least as a display of a rebellion. They leave the Democratic Party, at least temporarily. In 1948, they start this um, alternative party known as the Dixiecrat Party, or popularly known as the Dixiecrat Party. But it demonstrated that uh, this was a real wedge within democratic, big D, democratic politics. And it's ultimately what's going to do in the fair deal. For all intents and purposes, what I want you to know about the fair deal is that it was generally considered a failure. With one exception, and it's really ironic, and I'll share that with you in a minute, but it's generally considered a failure. And the reason why was civil rights. The South didn't want civil rights, and pretty much what they said is, we're going to get serious about civil rights, huh? Well, watch what happens to edu your education programs. Watch what happens to your health care programs. 
he didn't get much traction at all when it came through came to K through 12 education. And as far as the health care issue, what Harry Truman said that he envisioned, that's what you and I would call a national health care program. Now, even if the South didn't really mind that so much, um, even if it wasn't lined up against Truman for civil rights, um, the American Medical Association and these uh, big insurance companies had just learned how much money there was selling Americans privately issued insurance policies, and they lined up against it as well, calling it socialized medicine in a really hyperbolic time period when it comes to socialism, radicalism, broadly defined. But the one silver lining, the one area of the fair deal that Harry Truman actually does have a little bit of success would be civil rights. It's ironic that that's what sinks his fair deal boat, but it's the one place that he actually made a little bit of progress. And he did that, and I want you to write this down, by integrating the military. We didn't get a chance to talk about this, but we're going to fight World War II with a Jim Crow army. Harry Truman said enough of that, and he, with one stroke of his pen, with these executive orders, he integrated the U.S. military, and that was a big deal, considering the military had always been a cornerstone of American life. But outside of that, the New Deal is generally considered, excuse me, the Fair Deal is generally considered a failure. So for right now, what I want to do is change gears and focus a little bit on his foreign policy. In particular, I want to focus on Eastern Asia, which is quickly becoming a hotbed when it comes to the Cold War. During the, 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 the years that led up to World War II, and certainly during the war itself, it was Japan that had dominated the country that we call Korea, or Koreas, I guess, in our day and age. In any case, um, Korea was more or less colonized by the Japanese, and the Korean people had suffered mightily under Japanese rule. Well, as you know, the Americans are able to defeat the Japanese in 1945 with a little bit of help, not very much, but a little bit of help from the Soviet Union. And one of the things that we're going to do in Korea is very similar to what happened in Germany. It's going to be a group effort, so to speak, when it comes to rehabilitating it. We're going to divide Korea in half, and uh, the Soviet Union will take the lead in rehabilitating, reorganizing, getting what came to be known as North Korea on its feet. The United Nations, primarily the United States, but generally the United Nations is going to take the lead in what was known as South Korea, right? Everybody below the 38th parallel. Now the idea here is to put Korea back together again eventually. Here's the issue. The Secretary of State during this period is a guy by the name of Dean Atkinson. And what Atkinson's going to do is, is he's going to really get precise when it comes to the Truman Doctrine. This is where we will not see an expansion of communism from here to here to here to here. Well, while guess what country just so happens to be outside of this little parameter? You guessed it, Korea. The guy that is in charge in Korea is um, an ally of the communist in uh, China, the guy that will win that Chinese civil war, Mao Zedong, who had established the People's Republic of China, a communist country. We'll talk more about him here in just a second, but what I want you to understand is China is watching what's going on in Korea with a lot of interest, right? There's a lot of things that are going on there. Could be really good for China, could be really bad for China, depending on how things go. But you're going to see the Cold War come to Asia in the summer of 1950, because the guy running what at the time was known as North Korea is a guy that you probably know, even if you don't know, you know him, a guy by the name of Kim Il-sung, right? You might be a little bit more familiar with his son, a guy by the name of Kim Jong-il, and you're probably really familiar with his son, Kim Jong-un, okay? What you got here is three back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back family rulers of the country that would come to be known as North Korea, the eventual communist country. 
But going back to Kim Il-sung, he had dreamed of not only uniting Korea, but uniting it under the banner of communism. And he had really been in the ear of Joseph Stalin when it comes to, let me unite them. Let me push my armies across the 38th parallel and bring communism to the people of the South, thereby uniting both Koreas. And Stalin had been holding off for a long, long time, because keep in mind, the, the, the Cold War is ultimately a chess game, and he doesn't want to make any really bold moves, not just right yet, that might offend the Americans. But finally, June 1950, he's going to give Kim the go-ahead. He's going to give him the green light. And these Korean communist forces are going to begin to make their way down the peninsula, and they're going to take the American forces, the UN forces, entirely by surprise, and they're going to push them almost completely out of the peninsula. If you're looking at my map right here where I'm mousing over, right, it's really just the southeastern quarter, not even quarter, of that peninsula. That's where we're relegated to toward the summer of 1950. The guy that Harry Truman is going to turn to to save the day is a, is a hero of World War II, a guy who you may know about, a guy named General Douglas MacArthur. And what MacArthur is going to do is he's going to unleash a fierce offensive. He's going to push these communists not only back to that 38th parallel, the original starting point. He's going to say, what the hey, let's push him even further. Right? We didn't start this, they did. It's going to look like self defense, but we're, while we're at it, why not just unite both Koreas under the banner of democracy? We've got them on the run, let's push them into the Yellow River. Right? They're going to push further than the 38th parallel. As a matter of fact, the capital city of North Korea, Pyongyang, is, is, is not only going to fall to MacArthur, it's going to be the only communist capital in the history of the Cold War to fall during those years. Interesting, if you'll, if you'll stay with us a little bit longer in this semester. But in any case, he's right on the outskirts of the Yalu River. Now, it's really important that you know what's on the other side of that river. That would be China. And I told you that China was really waiting to see what was going on here, and they don't like it that MacArthur is that close to their newly established communist country. So what China is going to do is it's going to intervene. Keep in mind, it's not necessarily a combatant early on. It's not until the Americans begin to push dangerously close to Chinese territory that they actually get involved. But when they do, they begin to send human waves of communist fighters down the peninsula and they push the Americans right back to where we started, almost entirely out of the country. It's this back and forth seesaw that ultimately our next president is going to inherit. Okay, um, Eventually Truman and MacArthur are going to be able to fight their way back to the 38th parallel and a truce is going to be called a ceasefire, and it's really going to become official under Dwight D. Eisenhower. 1952 is another election year, and at that point in time, Harry Truman had been serving for seven years. Truman says, well, basically that's two back-to-back -back terms. I'm calling it good, and I'm going back to Missouri. The truth of the matter was his poll numbers were not that great, and he did not want to suffer what would more than likely have been a pretty noticeable defeat. Eisenhower was a war hero. You know, if there's one thing that we love to do in this country is we love to elect war heroes. And in 1952, Eisenhower is not only going to win this election, he's going to win the election by proclaiming he favored a limited form of government, right? Now, that had been the Republican Party's mantra for a long, long time now, right? At least since the 1870s. But Eisenhower is a really smart person as well. Eisenhower is going to campaign on the idea of modern republicanism. And for your notes, what modern republicanism, republicanism vowed to do was modernize the New Deal. What it said it was going to do is it was going to scrap old programs from the 1930s that we no longer needed because they were from the 1930s, it's now 1952, and it was going to modernize some of the existing programs so that they were meaner, leaner, and more effective. Right? In other words, what we're not going to do is we're not going to start scrapping the New Deal altogether. 
for two reasons. One, the New Deal was still very popular in the minds of millions of Americans, and two, the memory of the Great Depression was still very, very fresh. If you come in and you start slashing program after program, you end Social Security as the American people know it, that's political suicide, and Eisenhower knew it. So modern republicanism is not exactly really ultra-conservatism. It's, it's a very different animal, okay? Furthermore, Eisenhower's got this other challenge, and that challenge is that he's a Cold War president. He just is. Much like Harry Truman, he's going to inherit elements of the Cold War as well. But containing communism is going to require him to be active. You can't just sit on your hands and expect communism to remain in place. Um, there's a lot of historians, and I certainly consider myself one of them, that call Eisenhower's presidency the hidden hand presidency. He wasn't out in front of every program and every bill the way that Franklin Roosevelt was. He didn't go on the radio and chat it up. It was nothing like that. But behind the scenes and quietly, sometimes even covertly, it was Eisenhower that was pulling the strings and making some of these things happen. And as you can see, many, many, many of these federal programs that at the surface level seem to be very much domestic in their orientation, they certainly have a greater aim, and a lot of times that aim is containing communism. Several examples for you. Let's begin with NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. What NATO is, is an alliance between the United States and Western Europe that will come in, into existence on Eisenhower's watch. It proclaims that if the Soviet Union were to attack any or all of those countries, it would be perceived as an attack on all. If you invade Little Denmark, for example, Right? That would be an attack on the United States, on Germany, on Britain, on France, on everybody that was involved in this alliance. We were not going to make the same mistake that we made with Hitler. We were going to nip this problem in the bud. Right? It's Eisenhower that immerses us into that alliance. It's not some liberal Democrat. One of the things that Eisenhower, as a military man, knew that if, you know, things ever got really interesting when it comes to war with the Soviet Union, you better be able to move your military around pretty quickly. And you're not going to do that on Route 66. The way that most of our highways looked in the 30s and much of the 40s was simply two-lane highways. Eisenhower is going to rectify that in 1956 with what comes to be known as the Interstate Highway and Defense Act. You call this your expressway system. I-30, I-35, I-2, 75, right? What these things do, in addition to crisscrossing the country, what they do is they make getting around infinitely, infinitely easier. You know, for all intents and purposes, you can cross the American continent really in about a 24-hour cycle. I wouldn't really recommend it, but it can be done, and a big reason why is the interstate highway system. But understand something, if you're going to produce something like that, you're going to need millions and millions of workers, and at the end of the day, these guys are going to be working for the federal government. And not only do you need millions and millions of workers, you also are going to need billions and billions of dollars to do so. Speaking of billions and billions of dollars, 1957 was especially alarming to the American people considering that was the year that Sputnik was launched. What Sputnik was, was a Russian satellite that was launched into outer space. And when it beep, beep, beeped its way across the stratosphere, um, it sent waves of terror throughout the United States. Why? Well, the Russians can push a button and a rocket takes off and it's able to make its way all the way to outer space, What's to stop them from pointing that rocket at the West? And right before they push that button, they attach a nuclear warhead to it, right? In other words, the day and age of the Enola Gay delivering an atomic bomb, those days are gone. We're now fully in the intercontinental ballistic missile phase, right? And so what that meant was we needed to, we needed to not only get involved in the space race, we needed to win it. And so, responding to Sputnik, what Eisenhower is going to launch, no pun intended, was the National Aeronautics Space Administration, what we call NASA, right? 
And so what NASA is going to do in 1958 is really work to even, well, not even the score, but outpace the Soviets. And eventually we are going to turn the tide. By, by the early 1960s, not only do we have more missiles, but our missiles are much more accurate than their missiles, if you know what I mean, right? Part of why was Eisenhower once again pumped billions and billions and billions of dollars into NASA. Another thing that he realized is the Soviet Union was out nerding us. They had smarter nerds, better nerds, and we needed better nerds. And you're not going to get better nerds unless you have better schools. I mean, for all of Harry Truman's huffing and puffing when it comes to education, it was really Republican Dwight Eisenhower that got that job done. He launches something that we would probably be familiar with, STEM, right? Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Um, this has nothing to do with college credit or anything like that, getting a job. It has everything to do with beating the Soviets, right? Out nuking the Soviets. You're not going to do this without better scientists, better technology, better engineers, better mathematicians, better chemists, better physicists. You, you get the idea. And so what STEM ultimately traces its roots back to would be containing communism in the Cold War. Bottom line is... If you want to contain communism, you're going to have to have an active presidency. There's just no two ways about it. You're going to have to. And it's going to extend itself beyond what might loosely be called foreign policy, right? Now, I'm being a little bit vague, and if you need me to be a little bit more specific, there's a direct connection to this when it comes to civil rights. Here's why. For most of the early 20th century, certainly by the 1930s, the Communist Party in the United States was the only predominantly white organization that even faintly paid attention to civil rights, right? Nobody else really did. And so in any case, what we're worried about by the 1950s is that American-born communists are going to use this issue of civil rights to wedge their way in with not only people of color struggling for their civil rights, but use it as a way to overthrow the American government and bring about a communist regime. It could be used as Cold War propaganda, and so we're going to have to get much more serious about taking care of civil rights, right? In 1954, we make a good start. It's in that year that the Supreme Court is going to reverse its earlier decision involving is segregation legal or not. The Plessy versus Ferguson decision, all the way back in 1896, said as long as you have equal accommodations, you can segregate however you'd like, right? What Brown versus Board of Education is going to do in reversing this is use an academic discipline that did not exist in the 1890s. That's psychology. Psychology wasn't around then. Not only is it around in the 50s, it's a very well-respected academic discipline. And we know more about how the brain works. And what the Chief Justice, Earl Warren, what he says when he issued the Brown decision, was that the things that we learn early in our lives as children, those things tend to embed themselves into our subconscious and they never leave us. And so if you tell a child, a person of color, from a very early age that they're simply not good enough to go to this school, that lesson will stay with them basically forever. And you're not going to have the pursuit of happiness if you can do if you do that. And so what the court said in 54 in what comes to be known as the Brown versus Board of Education decision is that segregation in public education is not legal. But just because the Supreme Court says something doesn't mean that the letter of the law will be followed. In states like Virginia, there were open actions that were taken that were designed to defy the ruling. A couple of years later, 1957, there's going to be nine African American students that are going to test the legitimacy of this ruling in one of the more progressive southern cities, and that would be Little Rock, Arkansas. Collectively, these nine students are going to come to be known as the Little Rock Nine. And when they went to integrate, enroll at Central High School in Little Rock, they, they, were, meted, they, they, they were met by that group that you're seeing waving American flags at the top of that PowerPoint uh, slide right there. 
that would be your white citizen councils, uh, which was a very polite way of saying Ku Klux Klan. I'm not saying that the two were the same, but generally speaking, what they were there to protest was integration. They were there to hold the segregationist line. Things got heated, right? Fights breaking out, very, very tense filled moments. Um, it got so bad that the governor of Arkansas, a guy by the name of Orville Fabris, actually deployed the National Guard to hold the Fed, to, to hold the segregationist line. In other words, don't let these students in. So at that point, guys, Dwight Eisenhower has a decision to make, right? Either the Supreme Court decision means something or it doesn't mean something. As the executive branch of government, your job is to enforce the law. And the top court in these United States just got done saying segregation is not legal. What these people in Little Rock are doing is not legal. And not as far as we're concerned. Limited government Eisenhower aside, he knows he's got a job to do. And although he was kind of drug into this fight, didn't really want it, Eisenhower is going to federalize those guards which is a very fancy way of saying he's going to relieve those National Guards that the governor had mobilized, and he's going to replace them with the 101st Airborne Division. Those are federal troops, and with their bayonets drawn, they are going to escort those nine African-American Little Rock students into Central High School, and it's, 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 the, it's, the, it's the 101st Airborne that actually integrates that school. So as you can see, yeah, there's progress. There's a Supreme Court decision that at least on paper says you can't do this. And you do have a government, when, when really pressed, will act in the name of civil rights. But as you, I'm sure, can guess, that there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. And you'll see what I mean again and again and again over the course of this class. But one thing I want to end upon before I let you go is how monumental the Cold War is, in, not just in one aspect of American life, Certainly in foreign policy it plays a huge, huge role, but it does so in civil rights, it does so in the economy, it does so in American domestic politics, very broadly defined as we've seen here, and we're going to see it again beginning in our next lecture. For right now though guys, that's where I wanted to end.